When they hear what your property is doing and they hear the story about different programs you have and different things that are implemented into the, the lifestyle of the property and the culture, they need to feel like this is the place for me. This is where I need to be because I feel it on an emotional level. Welcome to the Student Housing Insight Podcast, where we are putting you in touch with the people who bring student housing to life. I'm your host, Wesley Dees, and joining me today is Greta Dare. Hello. How are you doing? I am fantastic. How are you? I'm doing great. It's been a busy, 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 busy time at Student Housing Insight. And that was are, so many busies. It was a lot of busies. I've been a busy bee, let me just tell you. <laughs> No, it's, I mean, it's been great. Um, obviously busy means we've got a lot of work to do and have had a lot of work to do. And it's, you know, we're winding down 2018 and the things that are coming in 2019 are just, are going to be huge. So um, can't wait to talk more about that later, later as in a future podcast. I don't want to, I don't want to go into a lot of details about it right now. Um, Ooh, so many secrets. Oh, well, yeah, they're not secrets, but we just need to make sure things are lined up correctly and all that good stuff. So, mm. yeah, I can't I can't wait to tell everybody about it. But as you heard from the the teaser clip there at the beginning, this episode is going to be about marketing. That was Michael Newton with Swarm based in Nashville, Tennessee. And we've had him as a guest on the show before, obviously. <laughs> and he's uh, he's obviously a huge friend to the podcast and Student Housing Insight. And that was actually from his presentation at Student Housing Insight's first summit that was in Charlotte back in October. So we're going to play that audio for you. It is also available on our YouTube channel, uh, as a as a video, but I've got to say I've listened to it as just audio, and I've listened and I've you know watched it several times as well. And I really suggest that people, even if you've seen the video, you listen to this on audio because it's yeah. I think we all kind of get distracted a little bit when a nineteen year old you know tells us how we should be marketing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that I, I know where you're headed with that. I think that really in general, that when we take away different levels of sensory or senses, that we're able to focus on things a little bit more or a little bit better. And I think that that might also be the case. It plays a major factor in this as well. And he, there are a lot of really phenomenal points that he makes in this presentation. I loved it there. And I loved it again upon re-listening to it. It's and I think that I think that you are right. Listen to something on audio, you're able to to quiet things down and really focus on the words and the points that are being made. So I, I definitely think that, yes, it's worth continuing to listen to. Yeah, it's like I said, when when I've listened to it, it was it just provided a lot more impact. And yeah, looking at the video is a little bit distracting uh, just from the standpoint of, uh, of, yes, he is 19 years old and we've talked about he is not the normal 19 year old. You know, he has he has started and sold business, businesses, not started and raised money and, and you know, dropped businesses. He has actually started businesses and sold them for a number of years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So and he's just he's got a, a great group of mentors behind him now. And I think he's uh, uh, you know, he's, he's the real deal when it comes to understanding Gen Z and and the type of messaging that they're looking for. So it's, it's definitely worth leaning in and, and listening. But in this in this episode, in this in this presentation, he's really breaking down. It's not you know, it's not about social media, which is his, you know, that's his forte. I mean, Swarm is a company based on using influencers to get your messaging out. So he really understands social media and, and certainly understands Instagram very well. Uh, but this this presentation was really about not necessarily how to market to Gen Z, but really how to market the human beings, which we all are. And he, he talks about um, six key points that your marketing needs to have a focus on because each of these six points are, are a person's part of a person's character. Some of those are you know more relevant with some people and, and less relevant or obvious with other people. But if you if you don't focus in on these throughout your marketing, you're and I'm not talking about just one piece of content, but 
throughout your your marketing plan, you are leaving a lot on the table. And as marketers, be it a property manager, you know, sitting in in, uh, an office on site, or if it's a corporate marketing director, we tend to have some some biases. We we you know, you may have, for example, one of the first or, or the first one that he goes over is certainty. Um, and being able to uh, having a marketing message that, and this is me, right? Having a marketing message that is talking about certainty in a product or a service is something that that resonates with me. Yep. Um, and and I'm you know likely to to pay more attention to it. But for my wife, it's going to be more about you know what type of contribution she can she can make by using a product or a service. And if if my messaging to, you know, her, you know, if I was a marketer and was messaging and I said, well, everybody needs to know that this service is going to provide certainty. It would just go through one ear and write out the other. I mean, she would not pay attention to it. So Michael really unpacks that and and talks about, um, you know, being able to do that, make sure that as marketers, you're not. Uh, you're not being biased on the message that's going out. He does. And I think that the key, there's a couple of key takeaways. And the first one you just mentioned, and it is the biggest one, and it is marketing bias. And it's something that I think that anybody who's listening, we've all seen, we've all been privy to, we've all encountered. And it does... It happens a lot where, you know, we're dealing with somebody who is in charge who's saying, no, I think that's a bad idea or no, I think that's stupid or, you know, I don't agree with that imagery or that promo gear or that idea, that event. I don't think that it's going to work. And meanwhile, you have, you know, people that are closer to the actual demographic, the students on the ground, the that are a part of this actual world who are saying, no, we for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm so funny because I'm actually thinking of an actual instance in my mind right now and you know this huge turmoil that occurred because of it um where you know these these people really wanted to do something and they were being told no repeatedly and um you know and i it's it's something that i wholeheartedly disagree with where it's generally I'm just going to leave all of that out. The point is, is that marketing bias does exist and it's something that we actually see across all industries. And Wes, I, you know, I brought this up to you when we were talking about this earlier, where it's something that we actually just saw in the media recently with the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show and their chief right. marketing officer, you know, bringing up and making statements in regards to the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show and social media and celebrities and, you know, really the public in general kind of pushing back and lashing out against that as it pertains to the device the overall diversity, body types, et cetera, the overall look feel of the Victoria's Secret fashion show and how, you know, the public is saying this no longer represents who we are and him saying, I don't really care. This is what I see to be as the fantasy. And he's a 70 year old man. And, you know, the public saying, <laughs> cool, you no longer represent what we see as fantasy. And, you know, and that's what we're talking about when we say marketing bias, what you may view as fantasy may not represent what the public that you are marketing to views as fantasy. And this is something that you need to be cognizant of. This is something that you need to be aware of, that it's okay to recognize, to listen. And and your whole purpose as a marketer is to is to seek first to be heard. And that's your purpose. You need to listen so that people will hear your message. And in order to do that, you have to, you have to listen and understand your audience. And I think over time, we have a tendency to forget that we have a tendency to stop listening. We have a tendency to think that we know it all. We have a tendency to become successful and think that we have all of the answers and that's never the case. Um, And that's something that, you know, it happens with major corporations. It happens with people. It happens with individuals. And it does allow for other companies to rise up and take place when you do start to fail. And we, like I said, we are seeing that in the world of lingerie um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, with the rise of Rihanna. So, you know, that's, it's, it's, there are beautiful examples of it. There will uh, be other people who do have their finger on the pulse of marketing and they will come up and pay attention. And that was one of the major, the major points of this is the marketing bias. And then he, he kind of swooped in with an underneath part of it and he explains it even further. And he, 
gives the beautiful points of here are the underlying values of every single person. And to me, there are, you know, Michael and I talked about this a lot before he actually went on stage. And, you know, it's there are individual. You can look at this on an individual basis of, you know, if you're going to cater to an individual human and say that, Wes, your individual values, your number one is that consistency. Like, you know, I think that you and I both knew probably while watching that presentation exactly what each of our values were going to be about each other. And, you know, and then there's generational values. And those are generally determined by the way that we're all kind of, you know, brought up during our generation. And those are things that we need to pay attention to and be, again, cognizant of when we are creating this collateral, when we're creating this imagery, and then create that message that we are then trying to, we are attempting to put out in front of them to convey a message and to bring them in, to get them to, to come to us, to pay attention to us. Because otherwise, if they're not going to pay attention, if they aren't going to, they're just going to scroll past it. They're going to glaze over because you aren't giving them anything that is intriguing to them because you aren't playing to any of those values that are interesting to them as an individual or interesting to them as a generation, because you are playing to your own personal values or your generation's values. So the overall, you know, those key points were, they're beautiful, they're worth paying attention to, rolling them around in your brain and thinking about them further on and figuring out how they are applicable to your own marketing messages overall. It was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's do this. Let's, let's, let's jump into the, let's, let's jump into the, the presentation and, and, let everybody hear that. And then I want to come back and let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, let's, let's just talk a little bit about some, some real, real world applications. Um, and, I, you know, I think talking specifically about Instagram and how people are curating and, and creating for, uh, for that specific platform. I think we, I think we should, uh, you know, go through some of the ideas that, that, you know, we've thought about that we've suggested to people and put it out there for, for the world uh, to understand kind of what they're doing wrong with Instagram. I think that's going to be very important. And, and I want to make sure that everybody that's listening to this is getting value and can walk away with something tangible to execute on. So let's do that. But before, I've got to tell you that this presentation was sponsored by TrustHab. TrustHab is probably a company you haven't heard of yet. Uh, th they really are just now getting their foot in the door in regards to student housing and their new company that is starting in student housing uh, because their product and service makes a lot of sense for, for the student housing buildings that we all manage. And that is, everybody's probably heard of the Internet of Things. IOT, um, which is basically a way of saying everything that we're using is becoming connected to the Internet in some type of way. And I'll, when it comes to facility management specifically, uh, there's a better way of managing that and, and using IOT and the platform that TrustHab has put together is really revolutionizing that whole approach to facility management. So. Chances are, if you're going to listen to the rest of this, um, you're probably on the marketing side of the uh, of the building and not necessarily the facility side of the building. But this is something that marketing folks need to to have on their radar because it's going to be something that your prospects are going to be wowed about. So anyway, let's jump into it and we'll talk to you after this presentation. Myself, my name is Tony. I'm the VP of Enterprise Solutions at TrustHab. Uh, as Wes said, you've probably never heard of us, and that's fine. Um, many of you may get emails from me on a regular basis that say, hey, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. If you respond, I'll respond back. It'll be fantastic. Get excited about it. Uh, but the important thing here is that what we do, how many here, who knows what a smart apartment is? If I say smart apartments, right? So a fancy apartment's got a lot of fancy stuff in it. Alexa, open the blinds, Alexa, turn the lights on, so and so. It's fantastic. Not a lot of applications in student housing. Anybody ever heard of the term facilities IoT? 
like three of us. All right, so facilities IoT, this is all about looking at things from a different perspective, right? So in smart apartments, you're looking at all the smart tech and how it's gonna affect the resident. Facilities IoT is actually looking from a different side of it. How can I use this smart tech to more efficiently manage my, my property, right? So let's say we, we'll do a very simple mathematical exercise here. You got a thermostat, it's got five basic points you can get out of it. Current temperature, ambient temperature, so set temperature, ambient temp, uh, the humidity, what mode am I in, and am I running, yes or no? Five points. If you hired somebody to stand in, a point, in every apartment you have for 200 units and write down every 30 seconds what that data was, you get three million data points a day. Think about what you can do if you had three million data points a day, and how just your HVAC is operating. Let's expand that out to door sensors, window sensors, smoke detectors, leak detection, um, the, the, the key locks themselves. All these things are what facilities managers need to really manage your apartment more efficiently or your entire property more efficiently. That's what Trust Hub is. We are taking all of those devices, aggregating into one platform rather than going with five different platforms to manage that. So that's high level who we are. Uh, if you ever want to talk about it, I've got one business card left. Whoever wants it first, come get me, I'll give it to you. Uh, if, I have, if I find another one, I'll give it to a second person. Uh, you know, when Wes reached out and said, hey, we're thinking about doing this event, I said, yeah, I'm in. And he said, well, I haven't even told you what it is yet. And I said, that's right, go ahead. I'll give you the floor, Wes. He said, well, we're gonna do an event at Whitewater Raft. said, I'm in, I'll sponsor the bar. He said, what? Is there gonna be a bar? Yes, Wes, there's gonna be a bar. Uh, <laughs> you know, but the reason for that is because one, these kind of events for me are very important. Uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily about us, the vendors, but really about you guys. At the end of it, you guys are the heartbeat of, this, of the organization you work for, right? As you guys grow and get better and make your properties more efficient and make your properties better, that's gonna help at the corporate level, it's gonna help with the industry overall, and it's gonna drive everything forward. I worked at college athletics for 10 years. Um, I'm a huge fan of student athletes. I'm a huge fan of college students overall. I want to see everybody get better. We can drive, it's a microcosm. Student, the student housing industry getting better will affect the entire student experience overall, right? And we all know that. We need to, definitely need to work on focusing on that. Uh, but again, it's looking at things from a different perspective. You know, we've talked about it a couple times today, but you have these big conferences like Interface and Student Expo that they had in California. They're wonderful. Sea level guys, we're looking at things from 50,000 feet. Hey, what building are you gonna buy this week? I don't know, I was thinking about this one over here. What do you think, right? Oh yeah, sure, we'll buy that. I'll give you this one instead, right? Uh, but that doesn't really help you guys. We can help you guys get better, and that's what this, this conference, or this summit's all about. And doing it regionally is even better because it makes it so much easier for everybody to participate. But again, just looking at it from a different perspective. I still had five minutes, so I'm really rushing through this. Uh, now, with all that being said, the next guy we got coming up, Michael Newton, great friend of mine for at least two hours now. Um, you guys will be really impressed. But in all honesty, I sat down with him for a few minutes. I was like, man, this guy's got a great head on his shoulders. He's gonna, think, look at, he's gonna help you look at your marketing strategy from a completely different perspective, because at the end of the day, it's not about you. And it's about identifying how to motivate the people you're talking to. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to listen to it. Uh, again, you know, I hope you guys enjoy as much as I enjoy speaking to him. But Michael Newton. So everyone, uh, as Wes just said, I'm Michael Newton. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called Swarm. Um, we do all things collegiate marketing. Uh, we, we specifically focus on influencer marketing. But really what my job is, is we help companies, specific, or right now specifically in student housing, um, we, we help them take their message that, that is curated by um, older generations, uh, I think is the, the polite term. Um, you know, because you know, you know, they're marketing to college kids. And uh, right now, and for the next probably three to four years, we're seeing this huge shift of, of the generation that's in college. In about four years, everybody that's in college will be a member of Gen Z. Now, can somebody please raise their hand if they've heard anybody talk about at a conference, how do we reach Gen Z? How do we talk about, how do we market to Gen Z? So it's, it's a thing that is talked about quite a bit and, and there's this like mystique around it. And to me, it's, it's, it's quite obvious why nobody really understands how to market to Gen Z and why there's this disconnect between the older generations that are in charge of marketing to Gen Z. It's, it's kind of hard for somebody who's, who's 30, 40, 50 years old to curate a marketing strategy to reach somebody who's 18, 19, and 20. There's, just, there's, there's a huge disconnect there. And what I want to talk about today is uh, something called marketer's bias. And I want to tell you what it is, why it's a problem, and how we can fix it to make our marketing better. So, Every human in this room 
and every human in the world that has ever existed has six core, sorry about this, has six core things that motivate them. And these six core things are at the very foundation of every decision and transaction that is made in our lives. So I wanna teach you all what these six, these six things are and then why they're important when we're marketing to Gen Z. So first I'd like to say that people think that Gen Z is this mysterious group of people um, that, that has like a weird way of thinking and, and views everything differently and doesn't respond to traditional methods and, and it's just this really mysterious thing that people are trying to do. Now as a member of Gen Z, I'm here to tell you that it's not that complicated. You know, you don't need, there, there isn't anything mysterious about it. From our perspective, it's very obvious why the marketing is, is quite frankly terrible. Um, and it just doesn't connect. And that is because, and, and this is sort of the, the overlying topic that we're gonna talk about is marketer's bias. So um, there are these six core needs that everybody has, these six things that motivate them. So I'm gonna go through those and then I'm gonna talk about how they apply to this big idea. So the first need that everybody has is certainty. People need stability, predictability, safety, and comfort. They need to know that their relationships and that their environment are secure and they aren't going anywhere. These people are typically risk averse and they're motivated by hearing things that, that reassure them that whatever they're doing is gonna be secure and safe and it's not, there's no unseen changes that are, that are gonna happen out of the blue. The second is, is uncertainty and variety. So this is actually the opposite of the first, which is, which is kind of interesting. So everybody has a need for variety in their life. This is why people travel. This is why people have different colored shirts. People need something different every day. Now, and, and keep in mind, uh, I should have covered this just a minute ago, every person has typically one or two motivators that are dominant in their life. So think of these six things as groups of people. So, so the group of people who fit into the uncertainty and variety group, and, and that's, their, that's their dominant motivator, they, they need surprise, they need, they need exciting things to come out of the blue and, and surprise them with change. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, the reason people are like, my girlfriend, the reason she has 800 t-shirts is because she's an uncertainty and variety person. Um, <laughs> there's not much else to say about that. Um, so the third motivator is significance. Now, people who are dominantly motivated by significance typically take pride in vanity. They take pride in accolades and achievements. They have a deep feeling or a deep need to feel wanted and needed. They need to feel special and in some cases superior. They thrive off recognition and, and awards. The fourth motivator is love and connection. Now, this is probably arguably the most important because from the very moment we're born, we had this need to feel loved and feel connected with others. Now, especially with Gen Z, I think this is, this is absolutely one of the largest groups of people is we're the first generation to grow up with native technology everywhere in our lives. Most of our human interaction happens through a screen. Our human nature tells us that that's not genuine and that doesn't fulfill our need to connect with others and, and feel loved and connected. So there's this deep need in these people to have genuine relationships, connect with people, feel loved, feel like they're part of a community and a family and, and, and really feel that, that friendship and, and consistent interaction with those that they, they feel connected with. The fifth motivator is growth. Now, the people who are, who are dominantly motivated by growth always need to be improving, whether that's emotionally, spiritually, um, experiencing new things, learning, and, and overall developing themselves. Um, this is the, the thing that drives them and makes them happiest. Now, the last is contribution. Um, and, and Gen Z has this, this is a huge group of people, um, and it's something new that we're, we're kind of seeing happen is they have this innate need to feel like they're doing something that betters the world, that feels like they're part of a movement that is, is giving to a cause. Um, this need is to give beyond their own needs, to help others, whether that's by giving their time or skills or money, whatever it may be. Um, and so this is kind of how they, they achieve fulfillment and, and happiness um, through this service. So there's these six core motivators, right? 
And each person in this room can probably identify with one or two that drive their decision making. Okay, so if this is the case, then the way I talk to one of you it, from the perspective of a marketer, the way I market to one of you should inherently be different than the way I market to five others because everybody has their own intrinsic value system and their own, their own couple things that motivate them. So this is where we get into this idea of marketer's bias. And the reason why I believe that most marketing, especially when we're trying to reach Gen Z, just doesn't connect, it doesn't stick, it just doesn't work, is because the people who are creating the messages, the people who are, are curating these marketing strategies and these marketing campaigns, are telling the story of their brand and telling the story of their property from the perspective of what they need to hear. They're, they're telling it from the perspective of what motivates them. So, if somebody is, is predominantly motivated by certainty and stability in their life, and they're creating a marketing campaign for a property, and, and they're pushing this out, and that's the sole focus, is they're hitting on those points of certainty, predictability, stability. They're talking about every Monday and every Thursday we have cookouts. We have these events scheduled throughout the year that you're guaranteed to go to. We guarantee you a parking spot. If that's all they're talking about, and the only points they're really hitting on are certainty, they're really only going to resonate with about 16% of everybody they reach through their advertising. That leaves 84% of everybody they touch with their advertising, it, it leaves it on the table. It's a huge opportunity that's missed. So what I want to kind of explain and, and hopefully give you all some tactical tools you can go implement tomorrow, if you will, um, is I want to teach you guys how to look at this, this list of human motivators and then understand exactly how we can implement those into our marketing so that when we are running an advertising campaign, when we are telling our story, telling our brand story, we're resonating with everybody. The idea being that when somebody hears about your property and they, and they learn and they're, they're listening to your story, they're learning more about your brand, what they're feeling is an emotional connection with the very things that motivate their decision making with your property. They need to feel like when they hear what your property is doing and they hear the story about different programs you have and different things that are implemented into the, the lifestyle of the property and the culture, they need to feel like this is the place for me. This is where I need to be because I feel it on an emotional level. And that's the disconnect that's, that's really not happening in most cases. And so I want to kind of go over exactly how we can do that. So let me go back real quick and go through these again just and, and sort of touch on you know, how, how do we use this to, you know, how do we implement this into our marketing? You know, how do we, we use this to better our story? So for people who are predominantly motivated by certainty, like I said a bit ago, you know, if you're marketing to these people and you're talking to somebody who's, whose main motivation is, is to feel stable and secure, the things you're going to tell them are the things that are just that, stable and secure and guaranteed. You know, you're, you're going to want to talk about that you, pro you guarantee them a parking spot. There is a set schedule of things that are going to happen at a predictable rate. There's, there's nothing that comes out of the blue. There's no surprises when they're living at your property that, that they wouldn't feel, you know, excited about. Um, so, so these are things you can implement. And, and this can be in, in the context of social media marketing. This can, this can be in the context of things you talk about to them when you're touring. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of applications you can use this for. So if you're talking to someone or you're trying to market to the group of people who are dominantly motiva motivated by uncertainty and variety, you're going to want to talk about the events that you throw randomly. How sometimes you have, you know, sometimes you have these, these awesome barbecue events out by the pool. Sometimes you have these movie nights that are just sort of out of the blue. Sometimes you give your residents a gift that they, they didn't expect and didn't even know about. People who are, who are uh, motivated by significance, ways you can use this um, to sort of bring these people into your property and get them connected is by, and it, it could be as simple as adding a new post, uh, a, social, a new social media post to your Instagram every week that basically highlights maybe a resident of the week. Maybe you're highlighting achievements that your, resi your residents have, have gotten uh, throughout their, their academic career or in their you know, as they're starting their career. There's a lot of things you can do. The main thing is that you're highlighting them and you're giving them something to be proud of. Um, and, and that's going to connect with them. That's going to resonate with them on a very personal level. 
So people who, who are, are motivated by love and connection, if you're going to try and market to these people, you're going to want to talk about how your, your culture, your community is like a family. That when they live there, they have friends who are, are sort of built into the price of the, of the apartment. That they, they will belong there and that they'll feel at home. People who are motivated by growth, um, there's, a, there's a lot of ways you can connect with these people. Maybe you can talk about how, how amazing your gym is and how the, the positive environment there um, you know, supports your academic growth and, and supports your, your ability to learn and develop personally. Um, people who have a need for contribution. Now this is something that I, I haven't seen a lot of properties do, but I think could bring a lot of value and allow allow properties to connect with this entire group of people, which by the way is huge, especially when, it's, when you're talking about Gen Z, is maybe you could implement a program into your property where one day out of the month, you know, the property gets together and they, go, can, they do some sort of community service, they work a soup kitchen, they do some sort of charitable, you know, some sort of charitable act. So that, let's say, somebody whose who's dominant motivator is contribution. If they walk in and they're learning about your property, and, and you learn that, that they're motivated by contribution, and you tell them, oh, well, that's really interesting because you know, every you know, 13th day of the month or 14th day of the month, we go do this charitable thing. Well, you will probably be the first property to have ever told them that. While they're shopping for properties, they're gonna be emotionally attached to, the, to that thing that is now attached to your property. And so they're gonna be that more likely to wanna live there. So, Really what I'm trying to get across is that when we're marketing to Gen Z, it's not some sort of mystical thing. It's not something that requires you to have some consulting firm tell you what to do. All it is is you have to understand that as a marketer, we have a bias where we want to tell our story from the perspective of what would motivate us, what would connect with us. And when you have somebody who's 30, 40, 50 years old doing this, trying to reach students, it's oftentimes not going to connect. It's just not going to stick. So what we need to do is we need to implement a, you know, we need to implement a, a, an aspect of our story into our brand in, in every single piece of marketing that we put out that encompasses and casts a wide net that will catch all six types of people. You know, and, and like I said earlier, most, most companies and most properties that I see are focusing on one. And when you only focus on one, you're only going to resonate with about 16%. You're leaving 84% of everybody you touch on the table, and they're not connected with your property, and you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, you know, and, and the last thing is that none of these are mutually exclusive. And, and I think marketers tend to have a bias to believe that. None of these things are mutually exclusive. You can, you can reach and connect with and build a brand that resonates with all six types of people without you know, without taking away from each one. And so I think that if we were to implement, you know, a strategy that, that casts a net that catches all six types of people, and we start to understand that when, when we're trying to reach Gen Z, we need to understand what their motivators are. And then we need to speak to them in a way that, that reaches what motivates them. So uh, the last thing I, I want to just touch on real quick is, um, sort of the, the how, do I, how do I figure out what their motivators are? Because that's, that's obviously like the main thing, the main question here. Um, it's as simple as this. If you're talking to, and by the way, like most, most people that are part of a specific clique or a specific group, they're all kind of the same. Um, and, and that's kind of bad to say, but like in college campuses, that's just the truth. Um, so if we, if we do, say, like a, a focus group where we find a fraternity guy and a sorority girl and somebody who's really hard in their academics, we find a student athlete, and we sit down and we talk with them about where did they live before they were at your property. You can do this with current residents. You can do, the, do this with people that are coming in for tours. And all you have to do is say, you, know, you find out where they were living. If they were living at a, at a dorm room, well, what did you like most about it? And their answer to what did you like most about it is going to tell you one thing that drives them. All you have to do is listen. They'll tell you what they need to hear from you in order to make that decision to live there. So if their answer is, well, we had these like parties that would just sort of come up uh, randomly. We would have, um, you know, sometimes we would have, you know, pizza in the lobby and they would, you know, call over the intercom that we had pizza in the lobby. That was really exciting. Um, sometimes we have movie nights. It was just, it was just a really great experience. Like, 
we would, we would not, you know, we would have all these surprises consistently. It's obviously an uncertainty and variety person. Um, and then if you don't necessarily get an answer out of that first question, just hit them with the opposite and say, well, what did you like least about it? And the answer to that question is probably going to tell you the same thing. Um, if, the, if that same person is an uncertainty and variety person, what they're going to like least about it was probably that it was boring. There was nothing cool going on ever. It was really bland and, and it wasn't an exciting place to live. And so when, when somebody tells you what type of person they are and which group they fit into, they're literally telling you what you need to tell them in order to convince them to live your property. And so that, I mean, that's pretty much all that I have. Um, hope that was, that was valuable in, in some capacity. So thank you all. Guys, there you have it. That was Michael Newton's presentation from this year's summit in Charlotte. I love it. I agree. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, really quick, let me just let me go go through and summarize again these these six motivators. I think earlier I just called them points, but these these six motivators when it comes to sorry, comes I called them values. They're things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so certainty uncertainty slash variety. Uh, number three is significance. Four is love and connection. Five is growth. And six is contribution. So uh, like we, we mentioned earlier, Greta, we wanted to kind of take this and then also apply it to uh, apply it to, to what we're seeing with, with Instagram from student housing properties and how they're using it, how they're not using it in a, in a lot of ways correctly to get the, the right impact and the right motivation that the community is looking for. You know, obviously that motivation is to attract people to your property that are going to live there and pay rent. Let me just kind of, I'll pose the question to you and, and we can, we'll just start the discussion, but what, what is it that you're seeing people do wrong with it? And when I say people, I mean, student housing properties, what are people doing wrong with Instagram? You know, Michael and I talked about this when we did the last, when we, he and I did our podcast together and, you know, I'm, I say it again. And a lot of people did hear it. I heard from a lot of people after we did that podcast and I loved the feedback that we got about it, but it's really, we're selling, we're not participating in Instagram. We are not, you know, uh, we did see some changes and that was really exciting to see. There are improvements, but they're still selling. And, you yeah, know, I, see I I see kind of two things that are happening because uh, I've got, you know, with Student Housing Insight has, you know, we have our own Instagram account and we are following properties. I mean, that's, you know, that's what our message is for. So regardless if it's your, your private account or I mean, not private, regardless if it's your. <laughs> we are not here stalking anybody. <laughs> regardless if or it's. Or are if, we? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Regardless if it's your if it's your personal account or if it's your your properties account, please you know make sure that you're you're following us on Instagram so that you can get a lot of the great content that we're putting out. But there there seems to be kind of two modes that properties are using, and, and one is the selling, be it you know putting out prices and specials and floor plans and, and telling people about the amenities, and then the other side or the other mode that I see everybody in is telling everybody about Taco Tuesday and hot chocolate in the clubhouse. And let me ask you another question because I don't, the first part with the selling, I, I think it's a complete turnoff. So let's go ahead and throw that out. Let's talk about this other mode that I see a lot of properties in and let's talk about if it's, if it's right, if it's wrong, uh, if it's a waste of time. But the promotions for all of the you know, resident type of events, I feel like a lot of it is basically an announcement page uh, of telling people, hey, this is what we're this is what's happening at the community today. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but just want to get your take on it. Oh, no, I don't think that it is at all. I have uh, really what it comes down to is. It absolutely should be utilized for that, 100%. It's really about how are you doing it? Are your announcements followed by, here's our current special, here's an announcement, here's our current special, here's our floor plan that's currently going fast, get in here today. Here's an announcement about Taco Tuesday, 
and here's our current special and here and so here you see that i just laid out and this is you go through any properties page and you see this over and over and over and over again where all if you look back through your past seven posts your past 10 posts 15 30 20, however many posts how many of those were you doing nothing but selling selling on an event selling on your property selling on a floor plan if all you're doing is selling, if all you're doing is advertising, then all you're doing is having people glaze past your posts. That's what you're doing. You aren't creating an experience. You aren't creating entertainment. You aren't creating anything engagement or engaging. You aren't getting people to listen to you. You aren't doing anything that is actually creative. And to Michael's point, you're not motivating no, you're not motivating anybody to take action. You are taking a message and I, I have my microphone in front of me and I want to take my hand and like smash it on the microphone because that's basically what you're doing. You aren't you aren't baking a big, beautiful cake and and making it lo- like just luxurious and wonderful and placing it in front of somebody and just like being like, doesn't this cake look amazing? Don't you want this cake? Doesn't it just like you're not <laughs> setting it there. You are making a cake and just like not even caring if it looks good and you're walking up to somebody and you are cramming it down their throat being like you will eat the cake like that is what you are doing right now with your instagrams and it's it's like hit or miss you don't even know if it's working or not it's it's killing me it's make the beautiful cake and then let people come to you and that's it's there is a good way to do it there is there is a great way to do it so so let's break down And I hate to talk about Instagram on a podcast because it's very, you know, obviously it's very illustrative. It's kind of visual. Yeah. But but let's kind of, let's kind of go through this. You know, the, the certainty part, uh, that motivator, what, what's a picture, what's a graphic, what's a video that could be posted to Instagram, be it in stories, be it in the post that, and I know I'm hitting this, hitting you with this off of left field. We didn't talk about that, but I want to put this out there. What type of visual thing and message behind it promotes certainty in order to motivate those people? You wow. Okay. <laughs> we can we can take a while to think about that. <laughs> that would promote certainty. You know what? I feel like each one of the motivated without breaking down each one of those, I think that each one of the motivators would be best represented through stories. Honestly, I think that you know, if you were talking about certainty, then if you, you know how I already, you know, I've talked about doing the resident takeovers. And I think that if you had an Instagram story that was done with a resident who potentially has lived there for a number of years, maybe you have a student who's lived there for all four years of their, you know, their life at college, or even if it's two years, and they talk about that, they do their Instagram takeover, it starts in the morning, that's something that they talk about. And that's one of your highlights that are now captured at the top of your page, um, or your Instagram. And, you know, you do that same thing through each one of those. And so if somebody goes through all of the highlights on your page, and they watch each one of your stories, you now have a high highlight with each one of your Instagram takeovers. And this is something that I hope to go into much more in depth at a later date, but that can actually touch on each one of those motivators through those Instagram takeovers, but through the eyes of an actual resident that can almost unintentionally speak to those motivators because they represent those motivators well, yeah, yeah. to the and audience. So, and so, I, look, I know I'll hit you out of left field with, with that question. Yeah, um, you did. And I, and I do want to go through and, and make this this tangible for everybody. He, here's what comes to, to my mind as you were just saying that and, and when it comes to certainty. You know, there are some things within the operations of a community that month in, month out, they are always the same that are that are services to our our residents and they expect those things to to work one of those being if you're providing transportation that should be something that and don't get me wrong if if this isn't true you cannot go out and and publicize it but if if you've got a a shuttle bus or some other type of service that you know Every single time it is it is on time. It's doing everything that it was advertised to do. Everybody does understand there's going to be things like snowstorms and those kind of things. But every single time it's something that they can count on. That's something I think you want to uh, you want to post from time to time. 
Uh, you think I'm right or wrong with that? No, I agree. And honestly, I was sitting here thinking about it and I'm, I was like, this is something that I feel like you can speak to. And this is why I feel like all of this is a team effort. This is not a one man job when we're talking about being able to properly post to these motivators and market to these motivators. Because Wes, I feel like it kind of, especially between you and I, it goes without saying, this is not one of my motivators. This is one of your motivators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's I mean, obvious absolutely. with the number of times that I've moved. This is not one of the things that motivates me in life. I do not not need certainty. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, knowing that you've got a parking space right outside your, uh, you know, right outside your apartment, if, if, if your company is built uh, that way and, and provides that, that's something, that's something you really want to put out there because I, yeah, for people like me, that motivates me when I know that the you elevator that. always works. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a, I'm a much, happier prospect to to know that I'm I'm going there and I've seen, you know, stuff in your Instagram post about your residents talking about reliability, things consistency, me. things like that. See, yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't care less about stuff like that. So that's yeah. why that would need to be if you were to lay all of those out, I would I, I would still need that team collaboration yeah. to be able to get all of that information. Exactly. Of all of the motivators that you were gonna ask me about, you would I was like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> So, so let's go to the opposite direction and talk about uncertainty. Now, this is when I feel like you can talk about price. Um, I feel like you can, but for me, when it comes to variety, that was the first place that, that went to me was, you know, when I was talking about the different highlights that you can do when you're talking about the resident takeovers for that one, that was one of the highlights that I wanted to see people do was there were two different ones, right? I want a highlight where they have a resident takeover and maybe they go to the pool, maybe they go to the beach if they're a beach property, but then also a highlight that encompasses like all of the, the events for like the year private or previous prior. And I think that between those two, that that's going to show that variety, the lifestyle variety, and that's going to really kind of encompass that really well. So you can see, and I think that that's going to kind of take care of it because if I see that from my perspective and I can see that those things kind of exist, then that's what's going to, I don't know why, but the pool one speaks to me for some reason. Like that was the first thing that came to my mind where I was like, yeah, variety. And I don't know if it's because I'm like thinking about a pool and I'm like, oh, different people. But I like the thought of a bunch of different people in that type of environment maybe that's my pool experiences i don't know well and it, it's kind of funny because you went you went to it with a you know with a visual about you know variety um I, i'm not exactly sure why mike put these together but it was both uncertainty and and variety so so here's what came to my my mind when we're talking about uncertainty and something that would motivate me if I read something in a post, again, more of a, this is the only one that I feel like could be about selling, about either A, the property is is leased up and there's limited spaces left or prices are going up. Is that something that, in your mm. opinion, we should, you know, we should be putting out on Instagram? Um, because that, that's a motivator to me. When someone says... I would say that that's hey, something. Hey, we're 87% pre-lease for next year. If you want to live here, uh, you've got limited time. Uh, so, okay, so I have two, actually, okay, so I have three points about that, two minds about one point. So one, it's, yes, it should be posted about because it's a notification. Two, it's seen as a marketing ploy. Um, but three, people never know if you're telling the truth or not. So it may motivate people, but four, so now I'm at four and I said three, so you're welcome for lying. Um, <laughs> but four, it's, I don't think that it actually necessarily directly falls under any of the motivators because I don't know that it's necessarily an uncertainty thing. It's, it's really just, I want to live here because it's met one of my motivators other in in other ways. And now I would like to go live there because you've created a sense of urgency and I don't want to lose something that otherwise met my needs by by showcasing, you know, meeting that, you know, that need, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not a it's not a thing of scaring someone into making a decision, although I do think you know, it creates a that, sense of urgency. Still, yeah. Uh, you know, and it could be about roommates. I mean, it could be about, you know, a resident telling their story about, you know, waiting to the last minute and not having, the, you know, a strong 
option on, on roommates or so make sure you find that housing early. You know, it, it, it could be those kind of things as well. Uh, but I do feel like, you know, that that uncertainty one is probably one you can lean a little bit more, you know, on a, on a cell, I guess. But don't take my word for it. I'm just saying things out of my mouth. So I'm not really sure. <laughs> are you if, are you saying things out of your mouth as opposed yeah. to your your ear, your eyes? <laughs> I am saying I am a man words of many talents, Greta, out of my I'm... mouth. <laughs> that is what I'm doing with my mouth right now. Okay. <laughs> so I, I'm going to, I'm going to skip significance for just a moment. Well, I'm going to skip significance um, because this is going to be a really long podcast. If we go through all six of these and give examples, but as you mentioned earlier, you're going to be doing a supplemental podcast for this where you can go through that and give everybody a little bit more information. So let's get past that for just a second. And we, you and I had a conversation on one earlier that I think everybody needs to, to, uh, you just made some really good points. And that was number four in the motivators, which was love and connection. Yeah, I think that this one is kind of a big one. And I think that it's it's really representative. And I, I will be covering this a little bit more. And like you said, the the supplemental podcast that I'll do with it. And so I'm not going to go as deep into the other areas that we can see this and why it matters and how we can get more information on it. But love and connectivity, this is one that is important for a couple of reasons. And it's it's very important specifically for this generation. It's This is something that we're seeing as a part of this generation. It's something that we're seeing from Gen Z. It's something that we're seeing from millennials. It's something that you see through social justice. It's something that you're seeing all over the place. This is, this is huge, right? Right now. And it's this is not the first time that we've seen this. This was something huge in the 60s. So and that's something that I will be talking about later. And so this is something that I think that is also and actually back up the second part of that that I, I mentioned was a part of this is also we have to think about the fact that for a lot of these, for, for the mass majority of these students, they're leaving their home for the first time and they're leaving their family, their level of comfort and their level of familiar. And that's a really, really big thing that and a really big step for a lot of people. And and so that's that's another reason why this plays a key factor. And so that's really keeping that in mind and how you can visually encompass that into a lot of to as many things as possible. You know, it's because we don't just sell things through pictures. We sell it through font. We sell it through uh, color. We sell it through through so many different forms of not just imagery, but also sound. And there's so many different ways that we can we can make this this complete picture of this motivator. And I feel like this one is truly, truly important. And this is one that we really need to focus on and make it as much of a part as possible. And I feel like especially on Instagram, it needs to be a part as much as possible, especially for our communities, because these people need to know, and this should be the truth for everyone. They need to know that our communities care about them and that this is something that we promote is this love and connectivity. Um, and so that's a really, really important one. So for all of you people that made it all the way to the very end of this podcast, bless you. Uh, but love and connectivity is, that's a big one, a big motivator that I would love to see really focused on and to somehow be represented in as much collateral and as much posting and social media as possible. Well, perfect. Well, can't wait for that supplemental podcast coming from from you guys. And just to before we sign off here, make sure everyone is aware that this week we'll be launching the the video on YouTube in regards to my recent trip to the UK. So look forward to that. It is about a company some of you may have heard of uh, called Unilodgers. Uh, which is based in the UK and India and Australia. And it's about international placement and a platform that they've created that a lot of UK operators are, are finding huge success in, not only for placing international students, but also a lot of domestic students are, are using it as well to to book their accommodations uh, for universities. So, that was a very, very cool experience and can't wait for you guys to to see that. In fact, they've even got one building in London that is 100% this past year, 100% was was filled from the Unilodgers platform. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, we uh, we break that down and, and 
kind of go over how these guys may be able to help you and kind of maybe what the future looks like in regards to in regards to booking apartments. So anyway, that's coming out this week, but I've got to uh, head to the airport to go talk to someone else about making student housing better, which is Woo-hoo. what we're focused here on. <laughs> Any other final words, Greta? No, sir. I think I've said so many words that there shouldn't be any more. <laughs> so many. So right. many. Guys, take care, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.